Good morning. Okay, so thank you all. Uh, my family and I are, uh, we love this church, and I'm honored to be able to serve Grace Point in this way for the next six years. Um, so last week we entered a new series called Witnesses, where we are looking at our identity and our privilege to speak Christ into the world, and I'm excited to continue our study in God's Word as we focus on our message as Christians. What is our message? So if you, if you have your Bibles, we'll be in Titus chapter 3 today. On September 22nd, 2004, Oceanic Airlines Flight 815, a commercial airliner flying from Sydney, Australia to Los Angeles, hit turbulence and it broke apart in midair. It's intense. And it landed on a deserted island. There were 48 survivors of this crash, miraculously. 48 survivors. How it happened? Who knows? And what followed this crash were some of the best six seasons of television you will ever see. <laughs> An amazing show. I'm talking about the show Lost. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to do so. Um, Lost had some of the best storytelling to ever grace our television screens. It had it all. It had action, it had humor, it had mysteries and twists that would leave you sitting on the edge of your seat waiting for next week. What is going to happen? I don't know. It's crazy. Now, as you can tell, um, I'm passionate about this show and was even more so when I went to college. Now, I went to college having had a couple of seasons under my belt and I just become this like evangelist for lost. Um, have you seen this show? Like, I, I, I kind of became known as that weird lost guy. Like, he just, he likes lost maybe just a little too much. Um, and, and what we did is uh, I started introducing lost to some friends. And, and as we began watching, of course, other people, they stick their head in and, and they get hooked because, of course, it's the best. And, um, and to the point where at the start of my second semester, when the new season is about to roll out, it felt like maybe perhaps a quarter of our dorm was watching Lost together. We were experiencing this show together. So Lost is the greatest show ever. Therefore, I was compelled to tell people about it, right? And maybe you've had these experiences where someone's passion about something compelled you to be drawn in. Like, Maybe a friend told you about the fish tacos at this restaurant and you got to try the fish tacos. Or, or maybe you've got to experience this place. You got to go. Perhaps even Taylor Swift's love for Travis Kelsey made you become a Chiefs fan. Conveniently, they're really good. Now, in the same way, the witness of Christ that's going to be most compelling in the world is from those who are in awe of the greatness of the gospel. And we will not be effective witnesses until we understand the connection between the gospel and our role in the world. And we're going to look at, uh, what we're going to look at this morning is how the gospel message itself connects with how we are to live in the world as witnesses. And we're going to do so in Titus 3. So if you can, uh, start turning there. But while you're doing so, just a quick grammar lesson. An indicative describes a fact, like the sun is bright. An imperative tells you to do something because of that fact. The sun is bright, imperative being, I should wear some sunscreen. SPF 40, let's go. Now, now keep this in mind as we read Titus chapter 3. Titus 3, verses 1 through 7. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, 
not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So there are two big things at work here. One is an indicative, and the, the other one is an imperative. And in Titus 3, Paul talks about how the gospel reshapes how we are to feel about people on the outside. The way in which those who have been redeemed by Christ should interact with those who don't know him. How the church is to be in the world. He says, again, verse 1, remind them, that's believers, believers, to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people, all. That's the command that, that Paul gives. But look what he does next in verse 3. Four, because... And then he gives one of the most clear, concise explanations of the gospel found in all of his letters. And gospel declarations are always the source from which commands are issued. We don't do these things that make us better people that God then approves of. It's that when we become aware of what God has done for us through Christ, our behavior starts to reflect those commands. So back to lost imperatives, I've got to tell you about this amazing show flows from an indicative, it's a great show. It really is. Streaming on Hulu. And in the same way, gospel imperatives are commands of what God wants us to do, and they come from the indicative declarations of what he has done. Before the gospel tells you how to behave or how to act or what to do, it tells you who to behold. Verse 3. And he starts with the description of all of us. All of us. Not just your annoying neighbor. Not just your spouse on the bad days. Not just your in-laws. All of us. For we ourselves were once foolish. We were ignorant. We were warped. We lacked true spiritual understanding. Paul says in Romans 1.21 that we were futile in our thinking and that our hearts were darkened. Continuing on, disobedient. It's, it's not just that we were warped and it's not just that we were distorted, but we disobeyed even things that we knew to be right. Now, my son, my son is smart and he has such a grasp on things that he'll often tell you the opposite of what is actually true. An example of this is he's a big eater. Um, so much so like burger night has become two burger night for Lewis. And it's got to have cheese as well. Um, and so he'll be eating those burgers, right? And chowing them down like, like um, uh, Kobayashi. And, um, and my wife will say, buddy, you are a bottomless pit. And he'll say, no, I'm a topless pit. That, that doesn't make any sense, but it's the opposite of bottomless, so he says it. Um, and obviously, that's a lighthearted example of our hearts, but we can know the things that are right and not do them, and we can often as well do the opposite. So we were foolish, disobedient, continuing on, led astray. Our hearts have a condition that make us susceptible to deception. Psalm 119 says that we are like sheep that are led astray. Sheep lack awareness. They're dumb. And they often follow other sheep into the wrong direction. They are vulnerable to external influences. They are often distracted and they rely on someone else to lead them. And not only are we just led astray by deception, like, oops, uh, I was tricked into doing that. We're not just tricked into doing wrong, but our hearts are ready and willing to be led astray, and we're born with the nature to do so. So about 10 years ago, <clears throat> I was at a dinner party amongst friends, and it was a lot of couples were there, and, and one of the couples had a young little girl, 
age probably two or three, and she was the only little girl at the party. And so we have, we have dinner, and then we move on to tournament. We start playing fishbowl in the living room. And she's kind of playing around in the background, you know. And in the middle of the living room was a coffee table. And on this coffee table was a platter filled with the most delicious cupcakes you've ever seen. Um, and so we're playing, and, and the little girl, she, she eyes the cupcake. She runs up, and she just swipes her finger across some icing, and she, she starts going to town. And she likes what she tasted because she comes back for another. And, and mom, in a very gentle way, and I'm just observing this, mom, in a very gentle way, not harsh, just grabs her hand and stops it and says, sweetie, we're not going to eat the cupcakes, or we're not going to eat the cupcakes like that. Um, and this little girl's response to this very kind, you know, redirection was to rear back and kick her mom in the leg. I'm like, whoa. Like, that, that was an extreme reaction. Like, taken to a new level. And my guess is that this was not a learned behavior. She doesn't, like, sit in the living room and, and watch mom and dad wrestle over the remote, or at least I hope not. But she was born with the nature to do wrong. She's two, three years old. This is instinct. She doesn't get what she wants, so she kicks her mom in the leg. That's all of us. Slaves to various passions. Continuing on. Slaves to various passions. Our separation from God has left a gap in our hearts, making us dependent on other things to fill it. Romans 6.19, Paul says that as unbelievers, we gave ourselves over to ever-increasing lawlessness. Think of us like spiritual parasites. We were made to take in and to be filled up by and satisfied by the glory of God. We were made for that. But sin has detached us from our host, leaving us actively seeking a new host. And this is why we take things, even good things, not just, not just bad things, and we have to constantly war against making them ultimate things. Be it your spouse or entertainment or sports or your sports team, you name it. And this is our natural state. We were designed to serve something, and if we're detached from our host, we have to attach ourselves to something else. And since these things never fill us up, we desire more and more and more from it. And this is why sin escalates. You don't start with the level of depravity that you see on the news. It's built from somewhere else. And it has to continuously be taken to the next level. Tim Keller said it like this, sin isn't only doing bad things, it's more fundamentally making good things into ultimate things. Sin is building your life and meaning on anything, even a very good thing, more than God. And whatever we build our life on will drive us and it will enslave us. Moving on, passing our days in malice and envy. Hated by others and hating one another. The natural state of the human heart can desire to hurt others and rejoice in having done so. Well, let's be honest. It's honest time. Have you ever felt that, like, twinge of excitement uh, when someone else gets tripped up? Like, ooh, this is, this is a safe place, new elder. Uh, um, like, I'm not talking intense stuff. I'm talking, like... Have you ever just felt a little excited whenever someone else doesn't get straight A's? Like, oh, shame. Oh, my poor thing, you know. It's sweet. Um, Paul says that we were hating one another. In Genesis 37, we see a great example of this. Joseph, the son of Jacob and Rachel, was favored by his father. And this sparked such jealousy and resentment amongst his 11 brothers. And that animosity reached to a point where they plotted to kill him. Plotted to kill their brother. And they had to be talked down from it. Talked down to just, hey, let's just sell him into slavery. You know, no biggie. Make him a slave. You know. 
Um, killing was just a bit too extreme. Let's just sell them on to slavery and be done with the guy. Um, we were hating one another. And this is our natural state. This is our natural condition. And in Ephesians 2, Paul says that we all were spiritually dead in our sins. Each and every one of us. All of us. And every unbeliever in your life is in this state before God. So verse 3 part, is part one of our indicative. We are all sinners. Verse 4, but. And this is such a good word here. This is the good news. And Paul's aim is to bring us head on with our depravity. Because in order for good news to be good news, you have to be well acquainted with the bad news. That you were, verse 3, foolish, disobedient, led astray, hateful, Slaves to our passions. That was us. That was every one of us. And we don't skip over that first part to get to the story of reconciliation. You're only telling half the story. That's like cutting out the middle of a rom-com. It's just like nonstop ice cream cones and Ferris wheels. It, I mean, what fun is that? That was a notebook reference. I'm ashamed to say that. Charles Spurgeon said it well. Um, Charles Spurgeon said, Too many think lightly of sin, and therefore think lightly of the Savior. He who has stood before his God, convicted and condemned, with the rope around his neck, is the man to weep for joy when he is pardoned, to hate the evil which has been forgiven him, and to live to the honor of the Redeemer by whose blood he has been cleansed. So verse 4, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, verse 5, he saved us. God saved us. The author of our salvation is God the Father, and you are a passive recipient in this. In verse 3, you're doing all the sinning, and in verse 4 through 7, God is doing all the saving. You do Nothing in this part. And how does he save us? Verse 5, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. And I wrestled with this concept a ton during my childhood. I was six years old whenever I was saved. I was, I was very young, but I knew the answers. I knew that I was a sinner. I knew that Jesus had died for my sin. I knew that, I was, um, that he had risen again, that he had ascended. I, I, I knew it. And I knew that I was justified in that moment, that my past sins had been paid for. I got that. But what I couldn't reconcile was the ongoing presence of sin in my life. I was under the impression that through the cross, my past sins had been justified, but that it was up for me to maintain my salvation and my good standing before God. So I was, I was also that guy who like walked down the aisle a lot. Um, and I would approach every revival, every D-Now weekend, every youth camp with the idea that maybe this is the time where it sticks. Like maybe I have such an experience at this place that it's going to carry me on to good works throughout time. That I wouldn't struggle with sin anymore and that God would finally be pleased with me. That was my hope. That was my mindset. Continuing on in verse 5. How, so not because of works. He saves us not because of works that I've done by us in righteousness, but by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. The word for regeneration in the Greek is palignasia. And it's a compound word made up of two components, palin, meaning again or anew, and genesis, meaning birth or creation. And when combined, palignasia can be translated as regeneration or new creation. And this emphasizes a radical transformation. It signifies a change of heart. That that verse 3 me, having experienced salvation and a rebirth, becomes a new man. You get new taste buds. 
you get new cravings. So I'm from a small town. So small, in fact, that we didn't have a Mexican food restaurant. I'm like, that's really sad. So whenever we would want Mexican food, we would go to the town over, Mount Pleasant, and we would go to El Chico. And we knew it was a good day whenever we, we'd come in the car after church and our parents say, all right, El Chico. And, and the, the morale just kind of increases two, two notches. Yes, it's going to be a good day. We're going to El Chico. And so we roll out the car. I, I scatter into my, into my booth. They, they hand me a menu and I say, no. I don't, I don't need it. I would like the chicken strips. <laughs> and I would like those french fries too. And don't forget the cup of jello. That cup of jello always hit. Now don't hear me bagging on chicken strips and french fries. You'd be hard pressed to find a stronger advocate for chicken strips and french fries. I love them. However, El Chico just wasn't the place. It wasn't the place for chicken strips and french fries. They are poured out of a bag into a fryer, placed on a plate, and delivered, delivered to you, but I loved them. But as I got older, as time went on, I started looking across the table. I'm like, wait, what is that? Is that, is that a tortilla filled with cheese and fajita beef? Like, what? Oh, wait, they're a chimichanga? The same thing, filled with cheese and beef. As, as there's a trend. I love cheese. Um, deep fried and t- covered in queso. And as I introduce myself to chimichangas, how could I go back to, at El Chico to chicken strips and french fries? You can keep giving me the jello, always, but... <laughs> Give me the chimichanga, please. John Piper refers to this as the expulsive power of a new affection. In summary, when we experience a deep love for God, it naturally leads to a diminished attraction to sinful behavior, and we begin to desire what is good. And this regeneration, this new birth, it's done through the Holy Spirit. He is the agent of the washing of regeneration. He is the agent of our new birth. Verse 6, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The Spirit pours out on us abundantly. And the reason we obtain the Spirit poured out on us so richly, the reason we have been given new life, the reason we have been saved and saved not by our own works is through Jesus Christ, our Savior. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake, He made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He who knew no sin took upon himself the sin of humanity on the cross, and as a result, those who believe in him receive the righteousness of God. And this is not based on our own merit. It is imputed to us through faith in Christ's perfect life, and his atoning sacrifice. Verse 7. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We have been justified through Jesus Christ. The free pardon of a sinner and acceptance of him as righteous through the righteousness of Christ received by faith. The payment of our verse 3 state that we all were in, not earned by you or me, but it's a gift of God. And whenever we have been justified, we are also adopted. We become heirs. And this is what I couldn't understand as a child. This is what I didn't get. That God didn't save me and leave the rest up to me, leaving me on this treadmill of receiving justification and then trying to maintain it. Rather, Whenever I was justified, I was adopted. I was brought into the family. I've got four adopted siblings, and they did nothing. They did nothing to earn their sonship and their daughtership, and there's nothing they could do to lose it. 
And this finally clicked whenever I was in college. Finally got it. And I was listening to a sermon in my dorm room, and the pastor said, he said that God doesn't love a future better version of someone you're going to be. That there's not this future me that's going to experience that D now and that I'm finally going to get it together that God is going to favor, that I'm going to eventually do enough good that God is going to say, well done, you did it, come on. But through the cross, his righteousness has been credited towards me. My bill has been paid. Righteousness, it's a state of being. It's not a list of actions. Do we understand that? Do we get that? Are you living with that freedom? With the implications that you are loved and you are justified and you are adopted now? Or are you continuing to rely on your good works to keep you in good favor? And let's just say that there came a time where you did. You did enough good. Well, that's self-righteousness. What good news is delivered to us here in Titus 3? So indicative part one was that we were all sinners. Part two, we have been rescued from our sin. So going back to the start of our time together, gospel imperatives, commands of what God wants us to do, they flow from the indicatives, declarations of what he has done. And that's what we just looked at. So the imperative today for the unbeliever, if you're here and you haven't done that, if you haven't put your faith in Christ, I implore you to be saved. You are under the condemnation of, of sin and you don't earn your way into God's good graces. You never could. So God in his grace and his love towards us made a way. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Unbeliever, be saved. And believe, imperative then for the believers. What do we do as a response to this good news? What is the way in which those who have been redeemed by Christ should live as witnesses to those who don't know him? And that takes us back to verse 1. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. The question isn't if we interact with the outside world, but when. And when we do, how am I to do so? What is the spirit in which I am to do that? Paul says that the church should have a marked difference as a result of our message, and he lists these seven qualities. Let's run through them. How, think about it. How are we doing? Submission to authority. And like We might think, hey, times are bad. I don't, I don't know if this, if this quite applies. Like Paul is writing to Titus, who is in Crete. Okay, And Crete wasn't some like amazing, God-honoring place. It was a region filled with pagan worship and immorality. Are you obedient? Do you submit to the laws of the land? And that doesn't mean we don't challenge authority, but when you challenge, when you confront, the spirit in which we are to do so is in humble submission to God, loving towards our enemies. Ready to do good? Are you helpful? Are you eager to do well to your neighbors? Is your community better off because of your presence? Like, if Grace Point Church were taken off of Denton Tap, out of Coppell, would it be an impact to our community? Would anyone notice? Is there good that's being inserted into the community by the presence of this church? And more personally, would your neighbors miss you? Would there be a loss in your neighborhood? If you were removed from your office, your cubicle just ceased to be, would your, off, would your presence be missed? We are to be a light to those around us. 
Speak evil of no one. Do you bless or do you curse with your words? Do you tear down or do you build up? Are we distinctively Christian in our speech? Are you gossiping? Peaceable. Are we loving towards our enemies? Gentle. Are you gentle? Are you an easy person to be around? And finally, he says this. Showing courtesy to all people. And as we consider who we were in verse 3, and as we consider what he has done, those two realities collide in such a way that we consider others differently. Those outside are image bearers, not just inside. And in light of them being an image bearer, they have inherent worth. In light of that, we are mandated to treat people with courtesy, that we show them respect whether or not they deserve it. We didn't deserve it. And even when we didn't deserve it, we received it. And that should change how we treat others. And the ultimate way, the ultimate way we show people courtesy is by telling them the truth. A popular quote when I was in college was, preach the gospel at all times, use words when necessary. And it seemed like, and it, it was big, and especially at my school, it seemed like some took those, that as an excuse that I just have to be kind. I don't need to tell others the reason that I am kind. And that certainly alludes to how we are to be, but we should absolutely use words. 1 Peter 3.15, Peter says, Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect should mark our message, but it's not our message. And what is our message? Our message is this, that we were foolish, we were disobedient, led astray, slaves to our passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another, but he saved us. We have been justified. We have been adopted into God's family based solely on God's good pleasure on the merit of his son, Jesus Christ. And Chris touched on this last week. <clears throat> In Acts 1, the disciples were face to face with this reality. They had experienced a crucified and risen Savior. And before his ascension provides for them the great commission, he gave them a task. He gives us the same task. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age." in response to our message. We are called to be disciple makers. We're called to be witnesses. And as we're doing so, we're marked with those seven attributes listed in Titus 3. And how do we do that? How do we go? I'll say, God has placed you in your given context and this given time for a reason. You are in your office, on your team, doing the work you are doing for a reason. You are raising your kids, being a disciple maker to children for a reason. As you work, as you rear, be a witness to the good news of Jesus Christ. In your neighborhood, toward your neighbors, around your dinner table, be a witness. At the gym, doesn't apply to me, at the gym, be a witness. As you go, be a witness. Mission work, although good, isn't reserved to two weeks in the summer. We are called to be on mission. We are called to be witnesses here, where you are. 
So lost, it's a silly example of a greater truth that I had this story and I had experienced this story and it was good. Like it was so good. And so I told people about it. And in the same way, we have been saved, not because we have earned it, but because of the loving kindness of God. And I love others by telling them the hope that you have in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the good news of the gospel that we have been saved and saved not by our own works, but because of your great love for us through your son. And I pray that that message would mark this church and as we go, we would be so captivated by that good news that we would be faithful witnesses and tell others. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive me for falling in love with our present state and choosing comfort over our calling. And I pray that through Grace Point Church, many in Capel and beyond would be saved. Amen.